Well, thank you very much for coming in. It's great to have you here. Um, you. And I've always been very impressed by Distilled. I went to one of your conferences about five years ago and absolutely loved it because SEO is my probably my main passion. Um, and what I was amazing about uh, Distilled is how quickly you became the, the thought leaders in the SEO space. Um, so can you talk on thought leadership as how, how you got there? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I don't think... I think any strategy that starts out saying, I want to be a thought leader, is a little bit of a, um, I don't think you get to say that about yourself. Yeah. So what we just really started out with was we were curious. Yeah. And we, so the company actually got started almost 12 years ago. Um, we, it was my, myself, my co-founder. We didn't have, we were 25. We had no money, no clients, no leads, no industry presence, nothing really. And it was a very, very slow very slow start. We didn't hire our first employee for, I think, almost two years. Uh, you know, we, we worked from his front room for the first 18 months. And so I think in the early days, we were just jealous of anybody who had any kind of leads that came to them. You know, that, that early day, those early days were literally walking door to door selling websites. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny thinking back, uh, literally wearing out shoe leather. And I mean, very literally, I, I actually remember having to get my shoes replaced quite often. Um, but uh, going, to the, going to the uh, cobbler quite often. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so I think we started out curious. Yeah. We wanted to learn yeah. and we needed to learn on behalf of our clients who we were building websites for at that point. And back in 2006, 2007, Google was the only real channel um, you know, before Twitter, before Facebook newsfeed. So we started just learning. We thought there must be secrets we didn't know. And we started from kind of reading everything we could, working from first principles. And I think that's, that's one of the, probably, if we're looking at the kind of tips-based side of, of how we got to where we are now, I think that's one of them, is yeah. first principles being yeah. really important. Uh, Elon Musk talks about this, kind of trying to figure things out from the ground up, essentially, how must this work? Yeah. So imagine you were building a search engine. How would you build it? Yeah. And you don't have to do that in a vacuum. You don't have to invent everything. You know, you can read how they did it, yeah. but you can also start to think, well, should this work? Should, where's it going to go? Yeah. If I was seeing these challenges or these attacks, you know, so thinking about 2008, 2009, uh, the internet is, is filling up with uh, content farms yeah. and they're ranking for every long tail query under the sun. And you can see this problem rising for Google. You can see it growing. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out what are they going to do about it. And, and you can see, you can work some of that out for yourself. You yeah. can see some signs. You can read bits. You put it all together yeah. and you can, you can come up with, and this was one of our, our kind of nice breakthroughs in that kind of era, was we were talking to our clients about the Panda update. Yeah. We weren't calling it that, of course, before there was anything like that. Yeah. You know, we yeah. said, this, this is coming yeah. and you've got to watch out for it. So, in fact, I was, I was speaking to a journalist uh, yesterday or the day before about the problems Google's having with voice search and the one box answers. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, with the rise of fake news and the yeah. kind of current polarized political environment and all this kind of thing, there's been a lot of coverage recently about the challenge Google is having where if you search certain controversial things, Google will give you a single answer, a single canonical answer that is absolute nonsense, you know, that they've pulled from some fake news site somewhere. And there's always been stuff that isn't true in Google. Yeah. But I think it was much less of a big deal, much, much less of a problem for them when it was one of 10 yeah. and there were all of the rebuttals and everything else was there. But especially if you're looking at something like Google Home, where you ask a question, you get a single answer back. And yeah. Google is almost saying, it's almost coming with the weight of Google. It's yeah. almost yeah, yeah, coming yeah. saying, Google thing. It must be true. Yeah. yeah. True. And, and I think it's going to be a really big pro problem for them. And yeah. so, again, we're trying to figure out, like, what, yeah. from first principles, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. And I, I think the answer is you, you massively dial up the trust you have to have in a website before yeah. it can be the one box answer. Google's done a ton of research on this, trying to pick apart those different kinds of untruths mm -hmm. because there's facts that are just wrong. There's things that are controversial. There's uh, deliberately misleading stuff. Yeah. There's stuff that's just politically skewed or biased. Yeah. Like they're all different kinds yeah. of problem. Yeah. And so I think you need to take different approaches in different areas. And, and I mean, there is a lot of research on it and we, we can link out some of that stuff. but. Uh, Nobody's cracked it. And the big problem, and I think Facebook has this problem as well, yeah. is if you're going to be a metrics-driven organization, yeah. whether you're Google or whether you're Facebook, the problem is people. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> the, I know exactly. the problem is that people actually like fake news yeah. more than they like real news yeah. because real news is challenging. It, it doesn't always agree with you. You don't yeah. always agree with it. You dislike it. Yeah. Whereas fake news is like, it makes you feel all kind of, oh, you know, I've, yeah, I've exactly. always been right yeah. about everything and this completely confirms all my biases. And so yeah. I think the big challenge they're going to face is actually to do better at this they have to disappoint their users yeah 
And the, the big danger is what if the organization that wins is the one that doesn't disappoint its users and therefore yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. you know just makes them feel yeah, 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 uh, you know yeah, yeah. stuck in their little filter bubble and, and yeah. hearing what they what yeah. they already believe but uh, yeah, yeah. I can see it's a vicious that. circle isn't it it's a vicious circle yeah. because you get sort of you know facebook as you know, the more people share those articles to those the demographics that are very similar to them yeah. the greater the virality of that content and and the more successful facebook is so yeah. so, so you know it's yeah, a huge problem for both of them uh, yeah, I, yeah. I am optimistic you know, yeah. i'm optimistic generally about yeah. <laughs> about everything really but okay. uh, i think that uh, i think that we probably will make a lot of progress in the next yeah. months and years. Yeah. But I think it is a, a really big problem for, for both organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One other question I've got is obviously you are the thought, you know, one of the Britain's probably leading thought leaders in SEO. Can you talk to me about what the future of search holds? The, f the big one at a company wide level is the growth of machine learning. Yeah. So Google under Sundar becoming machine learning first. Yeah. And with, uh, um, well, so I was going to say, with the replacement of Amit by John Ginandria, so Amit Singhal was the head of search mm -hmm. at Google and, and famously didn't really like machine learning in okay. organic search. He wanted an algorithm that was explainable. He wanted his engineers to be able to tell you why a given mm -hmm. website ranked better mm -hmm. than another one. Um, and, and so although they used machine learning in paid search, they'd always kind of kept it to the periphery oh, of organic that. search. Okay. So it was single ranking factors mm -hmm. like Panda or Penguin that, that were yeah. kind of coming in, but it wasn't the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, my, my thesis had been that p there was this line that w you could draw through his replacement. So Sundar replaced him with John G. and Andrea, who previously ran the machine learning division at Google. And you can see the rise of machine learning, and Sundar yeah. is a huge machine learning advocate. Yeah. Uh, that's become slightly muddied just as we've learned in the last couple of weeks that actually Amit was forced out of Google um, following some kind of uh, allegations around um, uh, some kind of discrimination, some kind of, okay. we, we don't know all the details really, yeah. but uh, he was hired at Uber yeah. and has recently been fired from Uber. And in the process of that, it came out that yeah, actually he was pushed out of Google. Okay. So maybe it's not as simple and cut and, okay. cut and dry okay. as, as it first seemed, yeah. but uh, nonetheless, the point yeah. stands that machine learning is hugely on the rise at Google. Sundar's a big, big advocate of it. And um, their capabilities are just coming on in leaps and bounds. There was an article in the New York Times Magazine in December that talked about Google Translate. One of the, it was about a whole load of stuff about artificial intelligence, but there was this anecdote about Google Translate, which had been built over a decade, hundreds of engineers, you know, many, many man years of, uh, of engineering work, and that uh, they'd had this idea, could we use machine learning instead? And they kind of said, oh, maybe you know, two or three years, maybe we could replace two or three years work where we could replace this. And uh, Jeff Dean, who's a kind of legendary engineer at Google, said, I think we can do it in a year. And the head of Translate didn't want to be the one who said, told Jeff Dean he couldn't do something, and said, well, you know, fine, off you go. A team of three engineers came back in a month with not results. only something that was no, better yeah, than incredible. the existing Google Translate, wow. but the amount it was better yeah. was a, it was a bigger improvement wow. in that time than they'd made yeah. in the entire 10 yeah. previous years of, yeah. of, of work. So the, yeah. the, the speed that machine learning is, just, is getting better yeah. is incredible. And so I think the, that's the big story. Yeah. Everything else comes from that because what that means is the results are going to get better. Yeah but they're also going to become more magical, more mysterious. Yeah, no, like how on earth did Google know that that was what I was looking for? Yeah, yeah. They'll be more personalized, more individual, yeah. uh, more, they'll take into account all kinds of other, mm -hmm. you know, environmental factors yeah. or history or wh yeah. whatever else has been yeah. going on with you. And so, uh, they'll, but they'll also become less explainable. Yeah. So both as marketers and even to Google engineers themselves, it'll be harder to say, like, why is this particular site the right answer for this yeah. particular query? Yeah. And um, so that's leading to a lot of our at a kind of strategic level at Distilled, mm -hmm. one of our big investments is into split testing yeah. in SEO. Have you launched a split testing product or are you about to launch a split testing product? Yes, we, it's, it's live, it exists. It's at uh, distilledodn.com. Okay. Okay. We called it the ODN, the Optimization Delivery Network, okay. because it deploys much like a CDN, like a content delivery network. Okay. Okay. Because uh, this is a kind of a different approach than, so I mean, you've probably done split testing for conversion rate optimization, Absolutely, user experience yeah. testing, yeah, yeah, those kind yeah. of things. It's different to that because when you do those kind of tests, you're deploying them in the browser yeah. and you're splitting the users. Yeah. So you're saying, okay, let's take, I mean, the simplest version is you take a, a page, create two versions, mm -hmm. show half your audience, one version show the other half, the other version and see which one converts yeah. better. And that's typically done with JavaScript in the, uh, in the browser. 
that doesn't work for testing the performance in search because there's only really one Googlebot. So you, you'd have to put Googlebot, when it crawls your website, would have to either go in bucket A or bucket B yeah. and either get the, you know, the control version of the page or the variant version, yeah. and then you're not split testing at all. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that uh, SEO split testing works is instead of splitting the users, you split the pages. So it only works on big sites, really. Uh, okay. And so you know, large e-commerce sites, big job sites, big travel sites, oh, anything with a lot of similar pages, yeah. essentially. And what you do is you, you take a, a change that you think you want to make, mm -hmm. and you change some percentage of the pages, yeah. and you don't apply the enhancement to the other pages, and you keep them back as a control group. And then as Google kind of recrawls and re-indexes your site, you look at the performance of the control group relative to the, the pages that got the enhancement. So a simple example would be adding structured data to a, a uh, product pages on an e-commerce site, for example, yeah. and you just add it to some of those pages and see if they rank better, see if they get better click-through rates, see if they get more organic search traffic than the. And, and so, is that integrated at what sort of level? Is it integrated at a CMS level? Is so, it's, it's JavaScript out, level, or sort of like it's, it is server-side, okay, but so it doesn't rely on what the CMS looks like. This is why it deploys like a like a content delivery network. So, okay. where, where a CDN, the user comes in instead of hitting your web server directly, they hit the yeah. content delivery network on the outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. which refers to your web server. We sit in between. Essentially. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and that means that we get to control the HTML yeah. that is returned. And so as far as a user or Google is concerned, yeah. you've made the actual change on your website. Okay. Yeah. But, in, but what we're actually doing is we're, enabling, we're making it easy to make that change just to 5, 10, 50% of your pages yeah. rather than all of them. Yeah. It's interesting, one thing that we, 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 we've got our own split testing right. sort of software that we've built in-house as well. And uh, one thing that we found on the traditional packages of, of yeah, conversion rate testing is is actually the latency that you yep. JavaScript latency mm -hmm. it actually slows down the page a bit. Have you is that something that your thing resolves because of these? Uh, so it, w th there's different kinds of issues. So yeah, yeah. we're uh, we don't cause any slowness in the browser okay, because of yeah. course what's returned is is just regular HTML. Um, we do sit in that network flow, but yeah. because we're inside the CDN, yeah. it's fairly minimal. So okay. yeah, we've got um, we've got some super fast sites on it. So I think yeah. I think the fastest one we've measured is we're returning uh, the entire page in 73 milliseconds or something, where you know Google's guidelines are 200 is a fast site. So uh, yeah, it, we can be super fast even with our stuff in place. Yeah. And so does it sit on an ultra scalable? It's in hardware. Oh, okay, so Amazon's it's okay. Uh, yeah, good, scalable good. Yeah, makes, makes perfect sense. Cool, fantastic. So um, perhaps moving on to sort of more leadership stuff. Mm. Um, so tell me a bit about the size of your organisation and and when because I know one thing you've done. Uh, you know you've been one of the successful. British companies to take the leap, and um, there's lots of uh, you know, and MVF is on that journey as well. Uh, you know, can you talk a bit about that sort of growth from from one office to multiple offices, and what challenges and and you know how you how you chose Seattle and New York as your as your leap offices? To talk to talk to me on those things, and talk to me about the scale of the organisation. Right. So well, so we're yeah. uh, forty something people yeah, right now. Okay, yeah. Um, and yeah, we're spread across three offices. So they're, they're kind of, especially our US offices are fairly small at the moment, but um, you know, but but hopefully going to grow in the next year. And we, so we started out in London, yeah. and we were in London for the first whatever that was, uh, five or six years of yeah. uh, of our existence. And then actually, it was kind of a serendipitous. Well, it was actually part of the the same story of trying to be um, part of this, figuring out what works. Part of the you know, what you call thought leadership. You know, this kind of education space, yeah. I guess, is we formed a close partnership with a company called SEO Moz, now called Moz.com. And uh, so they're based in Seattle. Yeah. And we, uh, we got to know them very well. We actually partnered with them. And we used to do, we delivered UK consulting work for their, for their or European work for their, for their European clients. I see, okay. So before they were a software and services uh, you know, um, subscription service platform, they actually did client work, right? They were, they were an agency, essentially okay. a consultancy. And so we used to deliver their European work. And then we gradually started actually behind the scenes delivering work in the US for them as well. And as they were tran that was as they were transitioning into a, a software model. And then late 2009, early 2010, they quit the consulting business to focus. They raised uh, venture capital and they focused in on their software business. And so they stopped taking on clients. And so uh, I remember the phone call saying, you know, from it's a great saying, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it, 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 yeah. it's you know, probably the, the luckiest business thing that's ever happened to us. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, but it came out of that same effort of con producing content, producing um, like trying to figure out where the industry was going. Yeah. All of that stuff was how we formed that relationship in the first okay. place. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that I think somebody talks about um, being lucky as, as increasing your surface area of serendipity. Yeah. Like the more you do, yeah. 
the more chance, the, the more, more areas you have people, that, yeah, exactly, that, that yeah. you get those opportunities coming in through. So yeah, it happened. Uh, you know, Rand said, "Do you want to come out to, to Seattle and open an office?" Uh, one of our team was up for it. So Rob Usby, who still runs the office out in Seattle, yeah. uh, moved out there, moved his uh, moved his family out there, and um, yeah, opened the office. So that kind of fell out. Okay, so so it's so opportunistic. Yes, sort of absolutely. So in fact, ironically, so talking about leadership, one of the things everybody talks about is having this uh, you know vision and mission for a company, yeah. and we'd just gone through a, um, a process of really trying to make that concrete at, at distilled just before this happened so yeah. september 2009 yeah. and the punchline the thing we'd written on the whiteboard was be the best seo company in the uk yeah <laughs> right we're going to focus in on the uk this is yeah. this is our this is our yeah. thing this is our mission and um then ran phones up and says do you want to come to america and we were like yeah sure forget that <laughs> yeah let's do that so i, I think america uh, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, UK yeah. and america and america yeah, yeah. and so oh uh, yeah little asterisk and so um yes yeah, so we ended up in seattle yeah. and then that was great, and because we had this relationship with Moz, they were passing us uh, new leads and so forth. That, yeah. that was kind of uh, actually the growth side was easy in that in the yeah, early days. And then New York was a bit more deliberate. You know, we said, well, if we're going to have eight time zones yeah. and you know have to get up at whatever time and work yeah. at whatever time, then uh, we might as well have an East Coast presence. Yeah. Where are we going to be? Well, we might as well be New York. And uh, actually, it was my brother who went out to open up our New York office. Okay. So he'd been he wasn't a founder of Distilled, but he'd been yeah. working with us for a long time by that point. Yeah. And he went out there, got the office up and running, um, and then uh, went off to do some other stuff. And he's, he's actually back consulting with us again now, kind yeah. of principal consultant type role. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how we, how we ended up in America. And I don't think it's a, a normal story, but okay. uh, yeah. you know, kind of worked for us. Opportunistic, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and, and, and how do you find the sort of managing that culture across time zones? It's a fascinating question because we didn't necessarily have a, plan for that we had no experience yeah. of it yeah. but then we had no experience managing anyone I think you know our first hire was literally the first person either myself or my co-founder had ever managed yeah. so it's all been a process of figuring out as, as yeah, we've yeah, gone yeah. along um, the I think the time zones are a bigger challenge than the distance I'd agree yeah. but uh, you know, Seattle is eight hours behind yeah. and that means we only have that little overlap in working hours so a lot of it is working flexibly yeah. and you know uh, Rob is often up early for conference calls with the UK yeah. we're often working late for conference calls with uh, you know with, with the US we try to build communication into everything I think the the thing the first thing that fails is communication and we've messed up on this like you know I'm sure my team some of my team might watch this and go you, you definitely <laughs> not got that nailed uh, it's been the thing we've worked hardest yeah, on yeah. and we definitely still don't have it kind of yeah. completely tied down um, but do you use something like slack we, we use slack now I, yes. I find that's been very useful for sort of like getting our US feeling part yeah, of the sort absolutely. Of banter, feeling part banter yeah. of the organization the, sort of uh, like, kind yeah. of water cooler chat yeah exactly um, yeah. but also the passive awareness of what's going on yeah, exactly, I think yeah, the more that, that you can um, default to open yeah. and have those conversations in in public even if it's two senior team members talking about something yeah if you have it in a channel where the rest of the team can see it yeah they see how those decisions are made and, and that pervades culture and i think uh, so there's that kind of thing there's um i finally i mean this was years ago but i wish i'd read it earlier finally read a book called uh five dysfunctions of a team by a guy called patrick Lencioni, and he also has written a whole bunch of others they're all quite similar but yeah. uh, another one is the obsessions of an extraordinary extraordinary executive Okay. And uh, the, I would strongly, they're only very short books, they're kind of parable, told okay. a story. Um, they're very easy reading. And I would yeah, very so. strongly recommend them to anybody in any kind of management yeah. or leadership role. And uh, they were actually recommended to me by, by an ex-client who's, who's now a close friend. And the, the, there's a few things in there, but one thing that sticks with me is the, uh, the, the, the way you bake culture into an organization. And so it, one of the obsessions of the extraordinary executive in, the, in this book is tying all decisions back to your core values. Yeah. And you know, they're not just things that you write somewhere, but you refer back to them all the time. Yeah. And so we've tried to bake that into everything from hiring to promoting to uh, you know, all those kind of um, organizational decisions. Yeah. So for example, when we're hiring, the, uh, one of the changes we made was to say, instead of, it's very easy to interview someone, couple of you interview someone, they leave, you go straight back in the room and start talking about them. Right? I'm sure that many people who've interviewed have had that experience. Um, but that's unstructured, means that you don't have kind of coherency about how different people do things. And we were worried that it could lead to kind of groupthink and just hiring people like us and yeah. you know, whatever. So we, um, we instituted a, a, a post-interview process where you don't go and talk to the person you interviewed alongside. 
you both separately go back to your desks and you write up your notes. Yeah. And you write it into a form that explicitly references your, the, our core values. Yeah. So you're rating the interviewee based on, in our case, you know, um, what do you think of their communication? Because uh, excellent communication is, is one of our kind of core values. Um, uh, ownership and getting things done. Um, uh, yes, smarts, you know, like we have this whole yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, list, but you're explicitly grading them against those things. Yeah. And that helps ground everyone on saying, you know, we're, we're looking for, this is what culture means, this is what distilled means, and this yeah. is how we're going to work together. So we've tried to implement those yeah, kind of yeah, things yeah, uh, across yeah, the business. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I found the uh, role of a CEO, you know, you have some great moments, you have some, some terrible moments, mm -hmm. and obviously you've got to pretend that you're always having a great moment. Uh, can you talk to me on, on what has been the highest point of your your CEO ship and, or, and the lowest point? Yeah, so I think the highs and lows, certainly in general terms, they, they all revolve around people, I find. Yeah. That there are kind of adrenaline highs or short-lived highs around winning some new business or you know, uh, winning an award or something public, that kind of yeah. thing, or standing on stage at, at yeah. a conference. Those are kind of short-lived, I think. The things that I find the highest as I look back over things, and certainly the things I anticipate that I'll look back on you yeah. know, in a decade or whatever yeah. and, and yeah. think that, that was really great, are around people. They're around uh, people we've worked with, careers that have developed, people we've hired early in their career who've gone on to be, um, you know, I was going to say household names, household names within our... Within you know, the we, we, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. Micro-celebrities, yeah, as we call them. Yeah. Literally dozens of people know who they are. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think that, that seeing people come in at that yeah. Early stage of their career and develop into uh, you know, leaders is the the most rewarding thing overall, uh, and I think that ties into the lows as well. You know, the by f it's kind of cliche, but by far the hardest thing is any time that you have to ask somebody to leave the organisation, yeah. whether that's uh, you know performance related or um, you know role, uh, redundancy type restructuring related or, or whatever it might be. And I think that the Actually doing that is hard, which is a cliche. Obviously, it's harder on the, you know, the, the person on the other side of the table. But the thing that uh, I've had the most kind of sleepless nights over has been the decisions in that lead up process and the, um, uh, the, all the trade offs that you're trying to make. You know, you're operating in a world of uncertainty. You don't have 100% information. You never can have. You're trying to make, uh, it's always the hard decisions. Yeah. that land on your plate, right? Yeah. If they were easy, somebody else would have made them. Yeah. And so uh, the, the stuff that bubbles up tends to be the, the, the unpleasant, the hard, the, the 51, 49 calls. Yeah. And uh, I think that, so one, uh, another, <laughs> another Lencioni book is, the, um, is all about, what's, I can't remember the exact title, but it's to do with being a CEO, basically. And um, one of the, oh, the temptations of a CEO. And one of the temptations, he basically says, everybody will have some combination of these. And my one is what he calls the temptation to be right. And that doesn't sound like too bad of a thing, but the way it manifests itself is that if you really want to be right all the time, then you will punt hard decisions. You'll particularly, you'll punt, hard, you'll punt decisions that, where you don't have perfect information, mm -hmm. hoping that one day you'll have more. Yeah, yeah. But often that is the worst decision you could make yeah, because yeah, yeah. A, you know, a poor plan, whatever the, the phrase is, a poor plan executed strongly now is better than yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the perfect plan executed later. Yeah. And that's the one I really struggle with, is, is I have to try and force myself to say, yeah, there's a deadline on this decision, it's getting made, and I'm gonna make it even though I don't have perfect decision, perfect information. And then the critical thing, which I'm you know, very much still a personal work in progress, is the way that's communicated. Mm -hmm. Because I always have a temptation to open up about it yeah, and, and yeah. say, you know, I'm really not sure about this. This is, yeah. a, this is a knife edge decision, could have yeah. gone either way, yeah. which doesn't really help the team. Yeah, yeah. You know, they want to hear, this is definitely the right answer. Yeah. This is what we're doing. And you know, yeah, there were other options, but this is definitely what we're doing. Yeah. And here, here's how it's going to pan out. And the, the, the temptation not to be wrong is I have a, this temptation to couch that stuff in, um, in vague terms. So I'll talk about uh, you know, being bigger or being better or being whatever, which is fine, it's directional. Whereas I think the, the, the argument goes that the strongest leaders can say, we're going to be, we're going to be plus 20% in the next quarter. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. And there'll be very concrete things. Yeah. And they'll be time-based and they'll be specific. Sure. And they'll be wrong. Right? Because you won't, it won't be plus 20%, of course. It'll yeah. be plus 15 or plus 25. Yeah. And the, um, the, the, argument, uh, the, the argument that I'm trying to work through is this. You know, 
I need to get over that, yeah, yeah. and then communicate along the way. Yeah. And then you, you, know, you can revise that. You can yeah. revise the plan, revise the estimate, yeah, yeah, revise yeah. whatever it is. But the, the um, concreteness yeah. helps in that communication, and that's something I'm trying to learn. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you seem to, you know, you obviously have lots of influences on your, you know, how you've developed as a CEO. Can you talk to me on, on, you know, where you get your input? You know, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I found that sort of the certain other CEOs that I've learnt a lot from. Um, I, I tend to be less book focused and more finding other CEOs who I really yep. sort of like can get great ideas from. Mm-hmm. Where do you where do you pick up your CEO learnings from? I guess um, other than just being a CEO and a doing bit, it, a, a bit of both. So I, I, I do. I love reading, yeah. and I love. Uh, I read a lot of nonfiction yeah. of all kinds, and I particularly like biographies mm-hmm. because I find that. So I hated history at school. Yeah. I, I was. I did maths, physics, chemistry. You know, very, very uh, yeah. sciencey maths kind of stuff. Dropped chem, dropped history at the first possible opportunity. Yeah. Hated the way it was taught. Mm-hmm. Now fascinated by it. Yeah. Would love to do a kind of you know um, a grown up uh, course in in certain kinds of history because I think that the it's the humanity of it that never came through yeah. in the way I was taught it, certainly. Yeah. But now, reading how real people struggled with hard decisions, mm-hmm. I find that the most distilled form of um, learning yeah. for me personally. So some, some of it is learning in the abstract from, from other people, whether it's yeah. uh, you know, the kind of self-help books like, like the Lencioni stuff, or whether it's more biographical. So um, uh, the, the other book that I would strongly recommend to anybody, so that anybody new to a leadership role, is uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is uh, written by a guy called Ben Horowitz, who is now a VC, but previously an operator. He ran, uh, you know, he, he ran a whole bunch of businesses and had to make some incredibly hard decisions. And he, yeah. the, the book is all about not glossing over the, yeah. those hard decisions. So part of it is that. Part of it is the same as you. Um, finding peers, finding yeah, yeah. Uh, people I can meet in person and, and bounce ideas off. Yeah. I'm a member of a few informal groups or, okay. you know, so that in fact, a Slack channel. Okay. Uh, so really, the, okay. I'm in one Slack group, I'm in one email group, I'm in okay. one Facebook group. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, these just different places where you, they're different circles. So some of them are explicitly CEOs or founders yeah. of small businesses. Some of them are explicitly digital businesses. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so different, yeah. different inputs. Uh, and then some of it in person yeah. with, um, so for example, we have a couple of uh, you know, external advisors to yeah, the business okay. and sometimes it's nice to just meet yeah, them yeah. for breakfast or something yeah, yeah. and uh, bounce the hard problems around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, fantastic. Um, one of the other questions I've got is, is on being a CEO and your responsibility and the, ro- the responsibilities it comes with. Do you feel there is responsibilities beyond the organisation that you're running? Yes, fascinating question. So, yes, but one thing I struggle with, and I'll, I'll get into what I think those are, but yeah. one thing I do struggle with is, is, is the difference between me as human person yeah. and the broader responsibilities I think we all have as people mm-hmm. and me in, a, in an organization. Mm-hmm. And so in particular, for example, I, I, I struggle with things like company level charitable donations. I would rather match donations or something like that yeah. where it's not me deciding yeah. No, or, you know, r- rather than distilled having a political position or a yeah, yeah. Uh, position that a certain charity bubbles up from, from absolutely within, the, the, yeah. the, there's a, a kind of a, a collective yeah, sure, going yeah. on there and, and I mean I, I pos- this is where I possibly screw, skew uh, too far towards the individual freedom yeah. end of things but uh, I almost go so far as to say I'd rather give them not match give yeah. whatever money was going to match just to the people yeah. and they can decide you yeah. know, they can make yeah. their own charitable donations or, or whatever else I, I, I oscillate a bit on that one but um, Broader responsibility, yes. So I think that uh, one thing we've been talking a lot about recently at Distilled is, is diversity, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, that's, it, it, that's actually an interesting one where I happen to believe that we can just selfishly do what's best for the business, which happens to be try and build the most diverse teams we can and you know, go looking for talent in places that nobody else is looking. Yeah. Uh, so that's an awkward one in the sense that it's actually it's a, it's a, it's a convenient one because yeah, it, it, it happens to be an intersection yeah. of uh, social good and um, uh, you know, hard-nosed business good. Mm-hmm. The, but yeah, I think that I think th- we have these responsibilities to be, uh, to, to, to empower the team, to, to create a, a great place to work, yeah. all those kind of things I think are, are would be true even if they weren't good, mm-hmm. or even if they weren't the perfect solution for the business. And so some of those kind of go above and beyond. So we try and bake some of that stuff into the core values. Yeah. So uh, our core values end with, we aspire to be the best place for the best people to work. 
Now we're never, we're never going to get there, right? That, that, that's a that's one of those impossible, lofty, uh, you know. That if you just if you could measure that, yeah. there will always be somewhere better that we're that we're trying to compete against. But it tries to guide us towards uh, the, the reason that's a core value, or what, the reason why it could need to be a core value is that it's not always obvious that that is the best thing for the business. But this is what we believe is what we're trying to do yeah. anyway. Um, so yeah, I think I guess they all tie together in in all kinds of different ways. Um, but we're um, I, I, I think the where it really comes from for me though is the human end, the, the individual end, that if we're individually trying to be um, good citizens, or, or however you want to phrase it, that we are, um, it, organizations are just made up of people. Yeah. And, and I think, so this is what, like, the, the, there, was, there, there was that transition, I, I yeah. distinctly remember the first time anybody ever said to me, distilled should. Yeah. And it was fascinating, because up to that point, it had been, you should. Yeah. Or you and Duncan should, my co-founder and I. Yeah. Um, you know, like, Distilled should buy me a laptop, a new laptop, or, yeah. or whatever. And there was a moment when it decoupled yeah. in some people's minds. But for me, it's never really decoupled. That, that you, that it's kind of, actually, it, it's just the only reason we have companies yeah. is to bring a group of people together yeah. to do things. So I, I kind of always come back to that human element. And so we try and, um, and then we try and empower the team a lot. Yeah. So uh, this has nothing to do with being good citizens, but the way that we do uh, to the like, equipment type stuff is, uh, every team member at Distilled has a personal budget. Yeah. Um, we call, it ended up being called the happiness budget, but uh, it's essentially the, 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 the small print says so, um, it's to be spent on anything that makes you happier or more productive in your job. So it does have to be related to your job. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, that ends up allowing people to decide what's best for them. Yeah. And that isn't a kind of top-down, you know, everybody must have a new chair, yeah. or everybody must have a new whatever. Yeah. It's kind of, you can choose between... That's really nice. Um, you know, that, like, that's a really yeah. lovely concept. And, so, and so, yeah. I, but that pervades over into the other stuff as well. Yeah. So I think that yeah. the, I would rather see that empowerment in how we all try and be yeah. good for the world, whatever that, yeah, 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 whatever yeah. that means to yeah. different people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, to the future, what, what, what does the future hold for Distilled? What do, what do, you, what do you see... Where do you see Distilled in five years? What, what? Yeah, so I mean, um, I should caveat it with, uh, I mean, I already told you the story about the, the 2009 uh, vision setting exercise that was, yeah, yeah, that was wrong yeah, in two months. So yeah. uh, <laughs> the, the caveat is you know, we love the adventure. Yeah. So I, I, I see us having a bunch of adventures we haven't even thought of yet, but uh, in, in kind of more concrete terms, so we're working on the, the software product. That's yeah. the big strategic initiative, and that's starting to pervade everything else. So in the sense that we're not looking to become a software business, but we are... Um, so the, the software needs a lot of professional service, a lot of consulting yeah, around sure, it. Yeah. So one side is, I, I imagine that on that kind of timescale, probably even sooner, three years from now, mm -hmm. we will have more than half our clients will be um, on the ODM platform. Yeah. Um, whether they came in as ODM customers or whether they're existing clients who we move on. And the reason for that is that that's, that differentiates us. You know, yeah. that we're, uh, not only are we running these tests that other agencies aren't, but um, we're, when we have this in place for our clients, yeah. we're able to be more effective and yeah. get more things done and be, you know, just get better results fundamentally. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that the, the next year or so, there's a lot of focus on, um, there'll be more of a focus than we've ever had in the past on specific sec sectors and segments. So we've always been fairly agnostic about the verticals yeah. we work in, but we're doing more and more work in e-commerce, yeah. for example. And so, so I think we'll be, yeah, so we'll be publishing a lot. There'll be a lot of new data. There'll be yeah. a lot of uh, new case yeah. studies, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of research into what works and what doesn't in yeah, that yeah, sector. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that, uh, you know, we're going to see growth and thought leaders and all, all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Well, I think you're already there. Thank you. Um, but thank you very much for coming in and appreciate your time and uh, it's been fascinating it's been talking fun. to you. Thank you for having me on. It's been, been great. Thank you.